God. The earth, the moon, the sun, the stars, the oceans, the mountains, the trees that grow beside the waters, the animals that come to the stream to drink. It's all your work. You have created it. You gave us the sun which marks the days and the moon that marks the months. It all fits together like the workings of a clock. Then you gave us the ability to care for it all. You gave us the chance to care for each other. There is so much work to do, God. Help us to remember we do the work for you. If we cook, let us cook as though your son will be a guest at the table. If we paint, let us paint as though the picture will hang in your house. If we clean, let us clean as if your angels are coming to our home to dance. We will keep you in mind, God, in all things, in all we do. When we labor and when we rest, you created and you took a break. We will take this day and stop. We will breathe. We will appreciate the gifts you have given us. Our hands, our feet, our minds, our hearts. We will look around and see our lives as a gift. We will be grateful for the jobs we have. We will pray for those who cannot find work. We will reach out a hand to help those who cannot help themselves. We will be grateful for this day, this moment set aside to say thank you to the one who began a good work and continues that work in us. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Today we are continuing with the letter of Paul to the church in Rome. But before we get to the letter, before we get to our passage for today, would you please join me in prayer? Father, we thank you. We thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your guidance, your inspiration. We thank you for the privilege that you have given to us to be called to be part of your people, the body of Christ. We thank you, Lord, in every way for the work you're doing in us and through us and as we approach now this letter that you inspired the apostle paul to write to the church in rome lord we ask you that you would let your word be alive in us we ask you father that you would guide our steps and that you give us a willing heart a heart that is willing to allow you to work in and through us to reflect your love in us, to pour your love in us, and then through your Spirit that your love may be flowing through us to be a blessing to everyone around us. Lord, may your love shine brightly in and through us, especially today in a world that so desperately needs it. So we ask you, Lord, that you would open our hearts and minds to your word and that you would guide us with your spirit so that we can not only understand it, but apply it and live it in our daily life. And we commit that to you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Brandon, at the beginning of this chapter, we are now in chapter 12 of the letter to the Romans. Paul turned his attention from the foundational doctrines that the church in Rome needed to remember to the practice that they needed to concentrate on. He had addressed in the first part of the chapter the reality of our commitment to God, the proper estimation of ourselves, our God-given function in the church and the proper exercise of our gifts in the community of faith or better perhaps i should say for the benefit of the community of faith we were also reminded that theology without practice leads to intellectual vanity on the other hand practice without theology leads to ignorance and superstitious practices and that is one reason why we see paul here 
laying out a, found, a theological and uh, doctrinal foundation and then building on that foundation to instruct our daily living, the practical living of everyday life. We have also seen that Paul stresses the application or the practice of our faith in the context of the church. So not in isolation, but in the context of the body of Christ. And he continues with that theme here in the second part of the chapter as he addresses important aspects about our relationships. But let's read what God inspired Paul to write. Chapter 12 and beginning with verse 9 of Romans. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another, and do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him, and if he is thirsty, give him a drink, for in so doing you will heap burning coals in his head. Do not become overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So the life of a Christian, brethren, it is obvious it is a life of relationships. But our relationships reach much further than our local community of faith. God's instructions affect every aspect of our life in the present time as well as for our eternal future. Every aspect of our life <clears throat> is about relationships because we are created to have a relationship with God, our our Creator, an eternal relationship with Him, and through Him, a relationship with one another as well. In verse 9, is written, Let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, and cling to what is good. So here, notice that it, it calls for that love that we were talking about, to be without hypocrisy. Our love for one another must be genuine, must be truly sincere. And I would like to remind you that we have defined from, from Scripture, from the Bible, we have defined love to be a giving of oneself for the benefit of a beloved in Christ. So love is a giving of ourselves. It's not taking pleasure or finding pleasure or anything like that. Sometimes obviously giving part of ourselves so the benefit of others gives us great pleasure but sometimes it's a sacrificial love that calls for endurance endurance of situations of moments that may be uncomfortable or even painful we will see more about that momentarily the greek term without it translated here in as without hypocrisy is anupocritus which means unhypocritical unfeigned genuine or sincere and sincere has a similar meaning to that and i in fact i would like to use that word uh, because the concept of purity uh, genuine and sincere applies here to that love maybe not so much as a an actual translation, but as an illustration. So I would like to look at the word sincere, a synonym of un, unhypocritical, 
uh, for that purpose. And it reminds me of the Italian sincero or sincera in the feminine, which comes from the Latin sinecera, which means without wax. And that was due to the fact that in, in Roman culture, sometimes people were making pottery, but they had some flaws. And so they would hide those flaws with wax uh, to make it look better, but, but they were not really all that good. And another concept of that is from the honey. The honey that did not contain the wax was considered pure, was considered a fine honey, and the, 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 then they became a way of stressing the purity of a heart that is sincero or sincere without, quote unquote, without wax. An alternative etymology, meaning an alternative origin of the word, uh, is said to be sinescar, which means without impurity or contamination, which, as you can see, has a very similar meaning anyway. So the, I want to use it that because it, it, we're talking about a sincere love, a pure love, a love without hypocrisy, a love that is not pretended, but it is true. And that kind of love is the most important ingredient for good and lasting relationships. That love, in fact, that genuine love, is the most important or is the most significant aspect of our spiritual life and our spiritual health. And it is a love that is not a pretense. You know, sometimes people can pretend to love someone. How do we pretend to love one another? We pretend to love one another by speaking kindly, by appearing to be interested in the other person. And maybe in our hearts, in our minds, we say, oh, I can't wait until I get out of here. I remember in one meeting, one day, there was a politician. And uh, I did not know what to think about that politician until I saw him in that meeting talking to someone speaking kindly, very friendly, very welcoming, and appearing to be genuinely interested in that person. But as soon as that conversation was over, I remember he was next to me, he turned around and he uttered very quietly, but I was able to hear, oh, I couldn't stand it anymore. I couldn't wait until that was over. And that kind of told me something about the heart of that individual the heart of that person. Sometimes we're able to even look like we empathize with the other person, but if the heart is not there, then it becomes just a pretense. The love that God inspired Paul to talk about here is not a pretense that would, you know, boil down to nothing more than just some politeness, perhaps. It is a genuine love. It is much more than just being polite. It calls for our time, our effort, the investment of our resources. And I'm not just talking about financial resources, although sometimes that may be the case. But I'm talking about our energy, our resources as human beings, our personal involvement. True love sometimes is manifested when it hurts. It's manifested when when it's difficult, when it's hard, when we feel spent to the core, and yet we still need to take another step because our brother or sister needs that. That kind of love is to be genuine because it is poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, who moves us to follow in the footsteps of our Lord and Savior. It avoids evil. It holds on to what is good. Not good for ourselves, though, but good for the others, good for the beloved. And it reminds us that evil will be defeated, but evil is not going to be defeated by force or by imposition or by conquering of some sort, as we might be tempted to think. Evil is going to be defeated 
by good, by that love, by the expression of that love. Because good will prevail, and will prevail forever, and evil is destined to be defeated forever, ultimately. But before we go ahead, I would like to invite you to see a short video. Because that short video will point out something about that love and how that love was manifest and expressed in our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at it together. I walked with him through the crowds, hundreds, pressing in from, from all sides. I mean, everybody wanted to be near Jesus. There, there was no way that he could see them all, but he, he felt. He felt their, their hurts, their needs. And so many times he would stop and right there in the midst of the masses, he ministered to the individual. We were always trying to rush him. No, we, we thought we were protecting him. <laughs> we just didn't understand. And then on that day, as he hung there, he looked at me and it just caught me off guard. He suffered so much. I can't describe it. And he looked down at me in the midst of his pain. He had to take care of one more person. He said, take care of my mom. He called me brother. I loved him like a brother. And for that moment, that's where we were. Mary buried her head in my chest. And she just wept. And I looked up at him. And I nodded. A little later, he breathed his last. To open the door. So that everyone could be a part of the family. Isn't that astonishing? Amazing are inspiring as an example of a love of God. And who would think that Jesus Christ on the cross, in the midst of that suffering, would care so much about his mother? That is an example of a love that we are talking about here, the love that God has instructed us to show to one another. Let's read verses 10 to 13. Be the devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Yes, there are quite a few things subscribed in here 
but it is a description of that love that is without hypocrisy. It starts with the instruction to be devoted to one another in brotherly love. I find it very interesting because that word, to be devoted, comes from a Greek term, philostorgoi, that is a combination of two, a very interesting combination of two terms. The one is philos, which means friend or someone with whom we share affection. It is a, a form of love, not quite as deep as the agape love, that pouring out of ourselves for, for others, but it is a love that is a friendly connection, an affinity with someone else. But it is combined with another term, also sometimes used for a meaning of love, which is storge, which indicates a family or a filial affection. So love then, the love that Paul is talking about, in, a, in addition to being a pouring out of ourselves for the benefit of a beloved in Christ, it also leads to a familiar devotion, an affection, in other words, that is characteristic of people belonging to the same family. And we see them, we see them frequently within the body of Christ. I remember times where my wife and I were traveling and we would stop in, in, in a restaurant during, during a trip to, to eat. And all of a sudden, in one case, I remember my wife just standing and say, you know, Luciano, I bet you those are, those are Christians. And she went to these people and introduced herself to those people. And all of a sudden, it seemed like we were family. We were just known, in, well, we just met each other, but it felt like we had known each other for years. And that's the kind of familiar love that Paul is talking about, that kind of devotion toward one another in brotherly love. But it also tells us to give preference to one another. We're called to honor and respect others about ourselves. I mean, ab above ourselves, uh, more than ourselves. We are cautioned against allowing ourselves to become lazy or stagnate in the expression of God's love. But a call to express that love toward others in all diligence with a fervid, passionate, enthusiastic heart, doing it all as unto the Lord, not, our, not for ourselves and, and not even for the other person, but for the Lord who calls us to serve the other person. We are to rejoice in hope. Now that in itself is not a description of fear or insecurity. And that, and that reminds me of the fact that that love is very powerful. And in that power we find security and we find the overcoming of fear. Perfect love, after all, casts out all fear. And it also gives us joy, joy in hope. No matter what the circumstances at the moment may be, we have true hope, sure hope in Christ Jesus our Lord. That hope may not be evident in the moment. Maybe our eyes are unable to see the outcome of what's going on, but we know, we know that in the hands of the Lord Jesus, all things will work out for the good of those who love him. Even though we may be going through tribulations, Paul was inspired by God to remind us that we are still called to express God's love by persevering and not giving up. We are never called to give up. We are to persevere and persevere to the very end. We are to express God's love by being gladly dedicated to prayer, not as a burden or as a sacrifice, oh, do I have to pray again, but as a joy to be able to present ourselves before the Creator of all things, before God Almighty, the sustainer of the whole universe, the one who owns everything, who sustains everything, who keeps everything in motion, and present ourselves to Him and be able to 
talk with them. Such a privilege. A privilege that we should approach with gladness, with dedication. And we are called to express God's love by contributing to the needs of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Just this week, we had a sister in Christ, a sister in our congregation who had gone through some difficult time and had to go through a surgery just the day or two before she had to move from her place. And because of the surgery, she had difficulty also, and because of her health, she had difficulty finding a place to stay as well. Well, I was so filled with joy when I saw the body of Christ stepping in and helping that woman out. People that, you know, you wouldn't expect to show up for a move People that you would say, well, they probably need help themselves. They would show up and, you know, they said, I may not help with a lot, but I can help with a little bit. And that little bit was precious. But what inspired me in that is to see the body of Christ coming together and helping one another, contributing to the needs of our brothers and sisters in Christ with the expression of that love that God pours in our heart by the Holy Spirit and expects us to live out, to express in our daily living. The modern situation that we see today all too often in the church, where we see in a Christian environments, in a Christian circles, where we see rich and poor Christians in the same communities would have been a shocking thing for the believers in the days of Paul. Their practice was to take care of the needs of one another in their communities. And one way of doing that was to extend hospitality, to extend a, a generous and friendly treatment of our guests and or strangers. Hospitality can be, of course, um, expressed and extended by inviting people into our homes, which, by the way, it is sad to see that it doesn't happen as often as it should be anymore, but it should be. But hospitality can also be extended in many other ways. I, I have seen people invited in someone else's home who expressed hospitality by being so generously friendly with strangers that they met in, in that occasion. And that, that to me displayed their heart. That hus in, in, and I could see in their heart that hospitality. I could see that they had a hospitable heart, I, I wanted to say. Verse 14, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Oh, that is a difficult thing to, 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 to keep and to do for most of us, for too many of us. What does it mean to bless? To bless means to not to curse or speak evil of. And you know, when someone persecutes us, when someone is against us, when someone opposes us, it's so easy for us to curse them, meaning to speak evil of them. But we're called to not to do that. We're called not to speak evil of those people who persecute us, but rather to speak words of genuine good and blessing to those who attack us and persecute us. That's our calling. That's our job. That's our duty as Christians. It's so easy to gossip and gossip all over town, gossip all around when someone has done something wrong against us. And you know why that happens? It, it happens because we want to buy pity. 
We want others to pity us. We want others to vindicate us. We want others to, to tell us, oh, poor you, look at what they've done to you. And we try to buy that with a currency of gossip. Oh, you should see what so-and-so has done to me. But do you know, Scripture calls that evil. It is so easy to do, but it is so wrong. We are called to do the opposite. We're called to manifest God's love, a love that transcends the circumstances. Remember, Paul was writing to the church in Rome. And I don't think I need to remind you of the type of persecution that Christians would face in that city. It was a violent, tragic, horrible persecution. And even in the face of that, God still inspired Paul to tell them, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Sometimes we feel so entitled to speak evil of other people because they've done something wrong to us. Well, let me ask you a question. How many people have placed us in a Colosseum to, to be devoured by beasts? And yet, that's what Christians would eventually face as a form of persecution in Rome, to be butcher, butcher's meat, in a sense. But the instruction from God still remained, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. So if those people in Rome receive that instruction, how much more do you think that we should be listening to that and practicing the instruction of blessing instead of speaking evil of? Let's go to verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Now, this is not a charade. This is not a pretense. This is true empathy that God inspired the, the Apostle Paul to write about. A true empathy stemming from a heart that is genuinely caring for others. It's not a pretense. Some people rejoice. Well, we need to rejoice with them. But when someone is hurting, you know, it is too easy for us to turn our head to the other side and ignore it. Or maybe offer a, a platitude. Oh, bless your heart. I'll be praying for you and leave them in their pain. That's not what this is all about. It is about genuine care. Genuine care that can be expressed in so many ways, but all of those ways demonstrating a giving of oneself for the benefit of that person in Christ, including perhaps not turning your, our head to the other side or away from that pain, but stepping into that pain. Stepping into the pain, not, not by just giving them a platitude or bless your heart, I'll be praying for you, but actually being there praying with them at that moment, spending time asking that question, how can I help you? Or maybe offering help without asking. Look, I noticed that you need this. Let me take care of that for you. Let me address that for you. Let me carry, carry your burden with you. And sometimes I know, I know that sometimes there is nothing that we can do. But I have been to the side of many people's beds. When there is absolutely there was absolutely nothing that I could do for them besides being there, praying with them, and being present in their pain, in their affliction, in their trial. And I don't remember a single one of them that did not turn around at some point and in some way didn't say thank you. And I always felt like thank you for what? I haven't done anything. But then I had to realize that perhaps what I had done is I had illustrated, perhaps. I had made personal, or in a way manifested, a much better 
a much greater and much more important presence, the presence of Jesus Christ himself with them. Because wherever two or three are gathered in my name, said Jesus Christ, my presence will be manifest in a special way. Let's not discount what the Lord can do through us, brethren. Verse 16, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Now that's another part that is kind of difficult, isn't it? How can we truly live in harmony with other people? Well, this statement here in verse 16 tells us something very important to maintain harmony between individuals. First of all, by being in the same mind. But how can we be in the same mind with one another? And the answer is by being of the same mind with Christ. If you are of the same mind with Christ, and I am with, of the same mind with Christ, then you and I are of the same mind with one another as well. We can live in harmony by not being proud or arrogant. What divides the people what divides the people is sometimes our arrogance where we want to show that we're better than they are or that we're right and they're wrong. And sometimes what kills harmony is this unwillingness that we have to associate with the lowly. And yet here we're instructed, do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Those who have no social status. By not regarding ourselves as being wiser or superior or better or greater than anyone else. Or conceited. Being conceited never, never brings harmony but division. Associating with the lowly is not natural. Even in our days as, as it was not natural back in those days in Rome. A city that had a great division between castes and between social statuses. But it's still not popular today. We are told everywhere that if we want to be popular, we need to associate with popular people. That if we want to be wealthy, we need to be associated with wealthy people. And I even remember individuals making statements such as, I cannot associate with that individual or with those group, with that group of people because they're they're too low of a status for me. We tend to want to be associated with those that we regard as being rich or important, or that so that we we ourselves may also be like them. But that's selfish. That is not an expression of God's love. God wants us to be mindful of everyone. Yes, we are not to, to neglect to associate with those who God, whom maybe are, have been blessed by God. But we are also not to be neglectful to associate with those who have not been blessed in that same way. With a, a social status or with wealth or other things that may be desirable. Verse 17. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. Now, Paul has been talking about hostility, facing hostility. And here in verse 17, it addresses it quite directly. In, in dealing with hostility in our life, it is so easy to be tempted to respond in kind. But that would make us no better than the offending party, would it? I remember as a child, my mother made sure that I would learn that lesson. As many other children, most other children, I should say, a number of times my brother and I were arguing, bickering, fighting, and then, of course, what would my excuse be? But he started it. Well, it wouldn't work with my mother because she would invariably answer, it doesn't matter who started it. Because if he punches you and you punch him back, what makes you better 
than him. You've done the same thing. So you're both going to be punished. You both are going to be grounded, or whatever the case was. So, like, like what our mother taught us, God is still teaching us today. It doesn't matter who started it, right? Answering an offense with an insult is just as bad as the first offense was. And why am I stressing this? Well, let me be very frank. Because I have seen too many couples argue and bicker with one another and, and giving themselves to the escalation of offense and insult and, and leading to explosive situations. That should not be. If we answer an offense with an insult, what good is that? How does that make us any better? <laughs> because my insult is a little more clever or a little better than yours, perhaps? I don't think so. Instead, we are to respect and practice what is right, what is honorable, what is noble. In other words, we are not to behave like just anybody else. In a way, for example, that is common in our society. But we are to behave, to live in a way that is godly. Not socially acceptable, but godly. Expressing our communion with the Lord Jesus Christ before everyone who is around us. That's what really matters. Verse 18. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Look, it may not depend entirely on us. I know that. The scripture tells us. But we should seek peace with everyone. So while we may be unable to actually establish peace, because peace is the two-way street, we should never be the cause for strife. We should never be the cause for discord. We are called to be peacemakers. As much as it depends on us, peace is the name of the game. As much as it depends on us, we are peacemakers, not warmongers. Verses 19 and 20. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Now this is a little bit of a cryptic statement. And uh, let, let me explain why. The key statement that then makes this a little cryptic is that statement of in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Some would believe that it refers to God's judgment of a believer's enemy. And it does take, uh, it does refer to that in verse 19, because it says, Never take your own revenge, your beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But we need to think in terms of how God repays. Would God take in consideration someone's repentance, for example? Of course, he did it for us. He will do it for others as well. And vengeance belongs to God. This is a clear assertion that is quoted here from the Old Testament. And he gives us the context by which we can understand this phrase. We are not to take vengeance, because vengeance belongs to a merciful and gracious God. So this statement, whatever that statement may mean, heaping burning coals on the enemy's head, does not promote a spirit of vengeance, wishing God to severely punish or destroy the enemy, because while the external action that is called upon here, like feeding the enemy if he's hungry and giving him something to drink if he's thirsty, might be right or would be right, their heart would not be completely 
in the right direction. It would actually be completely in the wrong direction. So that does not seem to be consistent with what the statement points to. It, we know that Scripture does not contradict itself, so Scripture cannot call us at one point to love and bless those who persecute us, and then another point to try to pile up the punishment, maybe with, with almost a form of despising, a form of hatred, a form of, uh, you know, putting, putting the other person down and, and try to pile up more and more punishment toward them. That, that's kind of a, the heart of hatred, not a heart of love. But there is another way of looking at it. Why we leave vengeance to God? Why we, allow, we leave retribution to God? We are told by historians that ancient rituals of repentance included the one of placing a pan of burning charcoal over the head of a penitent. It's, it's a strange custom for us today, but it was a custom that was used back in, in those ancient days. And Paul's statement could be a reference to such a custom. Indicating what? Well, indicating that the acts of genuine love on the part of a Christian may actually move the enemy to be ashamed of what he or she is doing and to actually come to repentance. There is a beautiful illustration in the history of the underground church in China. A young girl was imprisoned because she was a Christian. And one of the guards, the prison guards, would frequently go inside her cell and beat her up. When he would stop, she would pray for him. He would continue. He would beat her up again, and she would pray for him. Another day he would come in, beat her up, and she would continue to pray for him. One day, the guard, uh, the prison guard, just couldn't take it anymore. And so he asked her, Why? Why are you doing that? Why do you continue to pray for me when I beat you up all the time? So she answered his question. And he became a member of the underground church in China. You see, sometimes what God calls us to do we look at it as weakness. We think of power as the ability to overcome the prison guard. We think of power as the ability to be this giant or this bodybuilder that says to the prison guard, oh yeah, you're going to do that to me? Watch what I'm going to do to you and overcome him and maybe escape the prison and, and, and so on. Uh, you, you can see a Hollywood movie being formed in here. But true power, true power, and lasting power, comes from love. No matter what the prison guard would do to this young girl, there was nothing that would break her spirit, nothing that could stop her loving, nothing that could stop her being gracious and merciful, just as the Lord Jesus Christ was with her. That's power. Nothing can stop that. Nothing can overpower it. Because it's fueled by the Holy Spirit. It is a love that is poured, not trickled, poured in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, and it flows through us to be manifested by the, through the work of the Holy Spirit in us. And nothing can overpower that. So that's our calling. And I think we can understand this passage, this, this statement here, as meaning that while we leave vengeance to God, and God will give the proper retribution to our enemies, we're also called not to despise our enemies. We're called not to hate our enemies. We're called to love even our enemies, because in love we will overcome evil. With good we will overcome evil. Trusting 
and relying on God. And if for some reason that good, that love that God pours in our hearts and manifests in, in our behavior by the work of the Holy Spirit in us, leads that enemy, leads that person to, to experience shame for those shameful actions and repent, that we can join together and praise God, can't we? Let's go to verse 21. It's kind of a summary of that. Do not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So not being overcome by evil, including resisting the temptation to retaliate, as we were just saying, against someone who has wronged us. Overcoming evil with good calls for a relentless dedication to express God's love regardless of the circumstances, regardless of what goes on around us. So what's the point? We are created to, to have an eternal relationship with God. Think about it. We are created to have an eternal relationship with the God who is love. And of course, if God is love, and we are created to have an eternal relationship with Him, what do you think the basis of that relationship would be, if not love? And as we are made one in Him, we are also one with one another. And therefore, we are to relate in love with one another as well. By expressing His love, that is poured out in our heart and expressed from a pure heart and in sincere faith. The key to a successful relationship, no matter what relationship that may be, the key to a successful relationship is found in that one most important word, love. But that love takes faith. That love takes dedication. That love takes work. That love takes trust, faith, and a willingness for us to step out in uncharted ground, in uncharted waters. It takes for, for us to be willing to take the step of faith, much like Peter was commanded by or called by Jesus to do, when Jesus was walking on water and he met them, and Peter in the boat asked Jesus, if it's you, command me to come to you. And Jesus said, come. It took faith and trust for Peter to step out of the boat and for a little bit to walk on the water until he doubted, until he looked around and allowed the circumstances to change his thoughts to change his faith, to change his trust into, into doubt. Oh no, what, what am I doing? This is impossible. But what I find beautiful in that passage, in that story, is that Peter turned to Jesus as he was sinking and shouted to Jesus, save me. And Jesus took him by the hand and together, Peter, together with Jesus, walked on water again to get back on the boat. It takes faith to love. To truly love the way God calls us to do so, to truly express God's love that is poured out in our hearts, it's like stepping outside of that boat and walking on that water because the Lord, not to show off and see, hey, look what I can do, but because the Lord called us to do that. But you know what? There's good news in that too. Because that's the faith that God provides. That's the faith that the Holy Spirit gives us as well. He provides everything that we need. All that we have to do is to make sure that we use them. And that we express it. And we rely on Him. Surrendering to Him. Because really, that's the best thing we can do. In his end, we're secure. And 
receiving his love and being filled in our hearts from his love, we don't no longer need to go and look for love everywhere else. We can now be free to express it and to be the kind of people that he called us to be. God bless you. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Though he may stumble, he will not fail for the Lord upholds him with his hand. You call me out upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may There I find you in the mystery, in oceans deep, my faith will stand. And I will call upon your name, and keep my eyes above the waves, when oceans rise in my soul.
May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors.